one of the things y'all know about me, I've been in church for a long time. I've been in church my whole life. And the thing you get when you've been in church your whole life, as, as you get to be an adult, you really just get more questions. You've been in church, you know, forever. And, and again, I've told you before, I can tell you about the, the, the rapture and how many people come and what the, what the sound is, is going to be when it gets there. But as a kid, I wasn't taught how to be saved. I wasn't taught what it looks like. I wasn't taught what a, what a Christian walk was. I, I, I heard stuff all the time, mother, and I, I would, and, I, and I knew the word, but I didn't have a relationship. So as a young man getting married at 21 years old, I, I ran into a whole bunch of problems because I didn't, I didn't know how to be married. Nobody taught you how to be married. Nobody at, at, at a young age taught you what to do to be saved. We just taught you all the time what not to do, and you wouldn't be saved. Or we taught you everything that you would do, and you would go to hell, right? And oftentimes, we were more fearful of hell than we are in having, a, you know, respectful of a relationship with God. And as I got older, I began to yearn for a relationship with God, and then I didn't have to fear, just fear the things of hell so much. Amen? Anybody raised in church like that? And, and it took you a while to really get your relationship established because you had to work through all of the stuff that you had been taught, and then you were dealing with all of these all of these different things. And so as I, as I begin to get into my message, I need you to know it's okay to say amen. I need you to know it's okay to stand up. I need you to know if I say something that comes down your road, you can get up, you can shout, you can throw your towel up here. You can do whatever you need to do to show me that you agree because what happens is sometimes we can be so religious and we can sit in church and we can be so pretty that we don't even get God. So whatever you need, you can say preach black man, you can say preach ball guy, you can say my, my Instagram name is Big Zay, you can say talk to him Big Zay, you can say whatever you need to say, but I need you to get into the word because there are issues that so many of us are dealing with, but we come to church sometimes and then we go back home and we still take those same issues with us to, back home. And we say stuff like leave it at the altar and, and we say stuff like I gave it to God, but you give it to God, but then you... Take it right back and go back home with it. And so today I want you to leave those things here. And as we walk through, the one, the one thing, and I prayed it, I want to bind the spirit of defeat that's in a lot of our lives right now. Some of us have been dealing with this spirit of defeat, and we've been going through these areas in our, in our life where God has called us to do these amazing things. And Pastor Campbell started this message about this race and this walk, but a lot of us are in a place where we're down. And we don't want to run no more. And I'm, I've been hearing about this race my whole life. And I hear, you know, older saints at times. We say, I've been running for Jesus a long time. And I'm not tired yet. But what happens when you've been in ministry? And what happens is when you've been trying to run this race? And what happens when you try to get to where God has called you to? And you tired. And I don't mean T-I-R-E-D. I mean T-I-D-E. And I'm not trying to dispel the myth that, that God will give you energy. And I'm not trying to say that, you know, I'm tired of my walk with Christ. But sometimes in the things that God has called us to do, y'all, it can get tiring. And so I've been hearing about this Christian race. And I've been hearing about this journey. And so Pastor Campbell started the series, is, you know, walk, uh, walk the, run the race with faith. And, and he started with Hebrews 12, which you may not know, but Hebrews 12 is my favorite scripture. Hebrews 12, we're foreseeing we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. If you've got it, you can turn there. Uh, let us lay aside every weight and this, let, us, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race that's marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith for the joy before him. He endured the cross, scorning his shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. But what happens when you lose heart? And at 21 years old, I was at, at my older church, and the bishop was preaching, and I rededicated my life, probably about 19 or 20 years old, because he was talking about this race in here. And I was like, yeah, I want to get started. And many of y'all know Pastor Campbell is, you know, with the church is doing the race. And some of us are getting started. And many of us are just doing the race just because Pastor Campbell asked to do the race. But so many of us aren't prepared for the race. And sometimes you will start a race 
and you don't even know how to run. I was talking to Isaiah last night, and one of the things that he's working on as a baseball player in college, I like to say, y'all give it up for my son, because he is working his tail off at UNCW. He's working his, but one of the things that he said that he needs to work on and that he's never been taught, he's probably one of the fastest kids. I say kids, but they're grown men out there. But he's probably one of the fastest people out there. But he said nobody ever taught him how to run. So although he's fast and although he can steal bases, one of the things that he has got to figure out how to do is how to run and how to run efficiently so that he can do what they've called him to do. How many of y'all know that that's how this race goes, this Christianity, this race that we're on? You've got to begin to learn how to run the race because during the course of this race, there are going to be obstacles, there are going to be problems, there are going to be trials, there are going to be situations that if you are not careful, you won't be prepared for it. Amen? So let's read. Let's read. I, I like a lot of scriptures. That's why I like to know. So I know some of y'all are like, well, he didn't read the scripture like he did, and he told us to sit down. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew, Matthew the 26th chapter. And we're going to read a little bit. Matthew 26, and we're going to go down to the 69 through about 74, and I'm reading from the NIV. So it may read just a little bit differently from you. Um, but we're going to read just a little bit because I need, you to, I need you to get yours out of this word. I need you to get what you need out of the word. And it says in 69, it says, Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before all of them. I do not know what you are talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway where another servant girl saw him and saw and said to the people, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again and in oath. I don't know that man. 73 says, after a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Immediately a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken before the rooster crows. You will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. So as we talk about this race, I need you to do me a favor. For a title, look at your neighbor and say, I'm down, but I'm not done. I need you to look at somebody else and say, I'm down, but I'm not done. I need you to look right in somebody's face and say, I am down, but I'm not done. And you know what? And I, Woo! I hope I can speak it the way that that guy gave it to me. Um, because sometimes in trying to be so pol so correct with my speech and, and correct in my notes and making sure Aaron has my points, you can all, almost get caught up in the structure of your message and not be able to tell it, you know, be able to tell just the full truth. So I'm probably going to take my jacket off in a minute, y'all, uh, because, you know, the spirit is so full, my arms are kind of tight. You know, it's, it's all I'm saying. It's the spirit. I'm so full of the spirit that my arms are tight, but, but my mama would be like, sometimes you just got to tell it like a T.I. is, right? Sometimes you just got to tell it like a T.I. is. And so as Pastor Campbell started this, this series, y'all, I was so confused because so many times I hear people talking about they've been running with Jesus for a long time, and I'm trying to make sure that I get it right, and I'm trying to make sure I understand it. But what happens when although you're saved and you're sanctified and you're filled with the Holy Ghost and you're fire baptized, and you mess it up. What happens when you know what to do? The Bible says those that know what to do and don't do it, it is sin. But what happens when you know what to do, you know how to walk, you signed up for the race, you got the T-shirt, and you started, and you fall? Oftentimes as Christians, we don't talk about the fall. We talk about what you're supposed to do while you're up and how to run. But what do you do when you get to a place where it ain't looking good? What do you do when you get to a place where you are the one that messed up? What do you do when you get to the place where what you heard God say just is not happening? And I began to pray about this thing. And this thing got personal to me. And I'm trying not to just give my testimony and tell you exactly what happened to me on, on, a, on, a, on a trip, but I need you to understand that although you are down, you're not out. Sometimes as Christians, we can look around at the people in the church and when they fall or when they stumble, when we can condemn them to the point where people that are down don't even know how to get back up. 
we don't want to come to church. And sometimes you don't even want to do ministry, much less walk in the building and be condemned by the people that are around you because of the mistakes that you made. Now, oftentimes there are things that call us to stumble, and the, and the Scripture talks about things that in, entangle us or ensnare us. But sometimes, y'all, we just mess up. We just mess up, and, often, and as Christians, we don't talk about, we just sometimes don't get it right. In your marriage, sometimes you don't get, you know your husband been working all day, and, you, you know, he wants to come home to a good-smelling home. No, I'm just talking about, but, but you don't do it. You know why? Because he might not deserve you to do that for him. Sometimes your kids ask you to do stuff, and sometimes you say no simply because you don't feel like doing it. You don't have a reason. You know what it takes to be a good mother. You know it's, it's good to communicate. You know it's good to listen to your friends. And you got all of the instructions. But what happens when you just mess it up? If David was in here, you know, we watch a lot of basketball. And I'll say stuff like, man, he just blew it. And David's looking at me, we're like, you can't shoot. You can't play basketball. You can't do none of that stuff. And I'm looking at the screen, and I'm like, oh, man, Steph Curry. Man, he just blew it. We were watching the game. But what happens when you just blow it? What happens when you've been given the instruction, you've heard God's voice, Harkeem, and you just blow it? You just mess it up. Where is that example in the Bible? I started saying, where is that? I, I hear all of these other things in these areas that, that, uh, that, that people want to tell us to do to keep running and stay in the race. And the race is not given to the swift nor to the strong. And, you know, trouble don't last on white and weeping may endure. But how do I get back up after I've fallen? And who's there for me after I've fallen? As Christians, are we prepared to help those that are down? How do we look at people that aren't, haven't achieved the goals in their life that they said? How do we look at ourselves if we haven't achieved what God has called us to do? Who is quiet and here? How do we deal with knowing God has called us to greatness, but we dropped the ball? You ever been, anybody ever been in that place? Any, anybody, show of hands, anybody ever been in that place? Look around. You are, you're not the only person. You're not the only person that's blown it. Look at somebody and say, you blew it. But we, today, we're going to get it right. Amen? So I started saying, God, where is that example? And I began to, as a kid and as a young person, you begin to look at Peter like, how in the world can you walk with Christ? How can you see all these miracles? How can you be the rock? How can you be the person that Christ is going to trust with his church and you turn your back on him? And I began to criticize Peter. Why did I begin to criticize Peter? Because he had the nerve to after all that God had done to deny Christ. He had the nerve to after all of the miracles that he had seen to stand and look somebody right in the face and say, I never knew that man. And I can imagine at that point in life, Peter was at a place where he was like, what did I just do? I can't even believe it. How did I make that poor financial decision? How did I mess up in my marriage? How did I mess up with my kids? How did I mess up and cuss that person out at Walmart, even though I'm supposed to be a minister or an elder? Because we were trying to tell them how they were supposed to do better customer service in there, right? You know, you, so what you do is you cuss people out so that they understand how bad they messed up, right? You know, sometimes you just got to show people how to get it right. But how do you, how do you deal with the fact that you were given something from Christ and you've seen all the miracles? You've walked with God. He's done so much in your life, and you blew it. And so what happens is we begin to judge people just like we judge Peter. If I ask most of y'all in here, what do you think about? What's the first thing that comes to mind when you think about Peter? Most of us will say, yep, he denied Christ. Most of y'all will say, oh, Peter messed up. Most of y'all will say, well, you know, some of y'all might say, well, you know, Peter was reinstated. But most of y'all will say, I can't believe, oh, I just can't even believe that happened. And that's how we look at people in the church when they have issues. 
That's how we look at people sitting right on your road. That miracle that I just told you to look at, that's how we look at that person when you ain't seen them in two or three weeks. That's how we look at the person that's at church when they ain't joined your ministry or when they got to miss choir practice or even when they haven't achieved the things that you feel like they should have achieved. We look at them and say, how could you do it? You had the example right in front of you. I'm your example. Jesus is your example. How did you mess up? But the thing I need you to think about, I need you to think about Peter. What do you think Peter was thinking in this moment? Has anybody don't, you know, you just you don't have to show him, but how many, have you ever disobeyed God? Have you ever done something completely contrary to what you know God called you to do? And think about in this moment how you felt when it went the way <laughs> that it went. Anybody ever, don't raise your hand, but have you ever been called to do something? Have you ever seen the miracles? Have you ever known what to do and not done it? Don't, nobody, don't, raise, don't, don't raise your hand because I don't want us to look at each other like we look at Peter. Because my whole life I looked at Peter like just how dare you do my God like that. But what happens when you're down and out? And think about where Peter was. Think about where you are right now. And some of us are dealing with so many things. And as we look at Peter, I need you to understand that there is hope. There is hope. And I got to get back in my message because I don't know who I'm talking to right now. But there is hope. So for wherever you are, there is hope. So Peter had it all, y'all. Peter walked with God. Peter saw the miracles. Peter, Peter was even the guy that was like, I'll never do that to you, God. And then he got to a place where Peter just blew it. And so every once in a while, when we're on this Christian race, there are things that happen and op opportunities and obstacles that come up, and they get in our way, and we fall when we don't even expect to. When you're practicing for a race, you try to chart out your course oftentimes. You try to figure out what the terrain will look like. You try to, you try to simulate those things in your training. But there's some things that are going to come up on your journey, Sean, that you will not have the ability to prepare for. Amen? You thought by now your life would be easier. You say, God, in this rate, I thought I was in shape. You say, I can do this. And then you begin to think, I'm over some of the things that you're not over. And some of us are still dealing with some of the things that we were dealing with 10 years ago. And you thought by now you would be done. Why am I still stumbling over some of the things that, God, you've given me the victory over? And so we begin to look down on ourselves because we mess up on things that we feel like we've overcome. Amen? Why, why, why am I so big? Why? How have I allowed myself to gain so much weight? How have I let my marriage get like this? Why do I still drink too much? Why do I still smoke when I know I shouldn't? Why do I let my kids be like this? How did I let my finances get like this? And then we get to a place, mother, where sometimes we're just tired because we know that God has called us to do amazing work. But sometimes the obstacles just... They just keep us down. Look at somebody and say, I'm down, but I'm not done. Look at somebody and say, I'm down, but I'm not done. And sometimes, just like Peter, we get to a place. And the reason I need you to understand it, and I'm talking so much about how we get down, is because by the end of the message, I got to show you that there's some things that Peter did that help us get back up. So, so I'm not just trying to help keep you where you are, but at some point, we've got to begin to turn the corner in this race, and we've got to get back up. Look at somebody and say, get back up. But sometimes we get so far down. And I know you can't believe this, but we begin to deny Christ. And we don't deny him the way that, that Peter did. But what we do is we begin to deny the call that he has on our life. And we begin to say, God, I, ain't, I don't even know if my, my family can get any better. I don't know if my marriage can get any better. I don't know if I can do the thing that you've called me to. I don't know if I can walk out this walk. I don't know if I can start the business. I don't know. Because sometimes we get so far down that we can't even begin to see what God called us to do. So we begin to deny God's power. We've seen them do miracles in everybody's life. We've seen them raise the dead. We've seen them heal the sick. We've seen, every, we've seen people get good jobs. We've seen people start businesses. But we begin to deny the word that God gave us because we're sometimes so 
far down. Anybody ever felt like that? Ooh. As I began to study the word, I, I began to think about my own walk in ministry and in Christ. And, and if you know me, many of you know that sometimes I deal with dealing with my own insecurities. And what the enemy wants to do is he wants me to get so down on myself that I begin to close myself off from the word of God. And oftentimes when we're in that place, it doesn't matter what your wife says. It doesn't matter what your sister says. It doesn't matter what your aunt or your uncle or anybody says to you. You can't see it because you're so far down. And you begin to, like Peter did, you begin to deny that Christ even has the power to pull you up out of your situation. Amen. So today we're going to walk out of here in victory because we're going to give you a couple of things that Peter did in that moment. But what does it mean to deny? Because some of y'all are looking at me like, well, I never denied Christ. I don't, I don't deny. What, but what does, so what does deny mean? Deny means to declare not to be true, to gainsay, to contradict, or it means opposed to affirm, allow, or admit. How many times have you denied God and what he's called you to do? How many times have you let the situation that you are dealing with right now determine the fact that you won't even try to go after what God said? How many times have you failed? And because of that failure, now you won't pursue the calling of God. And on a race, you can't stay down. When you start the race, you got to finish. One of our sayings in our family is, hunters never quit. So even though you fall, you can't stay down. But how many times have we stopped pursuing God because the situation that we're in doesn't look like what he said? <laughs> Ooh. And sometimes when the race gets hard, when it doesn't look like you thought it would look by now, when obstacles get in your way, how often do we begin to deny and go back to what's familiar? Pastor Gamble gave the lesson on how he was able to go, you know, so many days without eating. But when it came to intermittent fasting, he couldn't go 12 hours. How can you sit so close to God? How can you know he has restoration power? How can you know he has the ability to, to solve and restore? But we sit there as Christians and we can't move and we're paralyzed in our place of being down because we're denying what Christ said that he would do in our lives. It's tough. My dad would say it's tight, but it's right. And so often we get so far down in ourselves that we can no longer see God. And the thing is, this wasn't Peter's first rodeo. This is the same Peter that walked on water. And I know that if you look in your Bible, it'll say Jesus walked on water. But, but Peter was, I, I began to think Peter was really like us. And in our businesses and what God has called us to do, even though God has given us everything we need to do to move on, Peter said, Lord, I see you walking, but if it is you, then bid me to come. And it's the same way we do when we get in our situations. God, I know you told me to start this business, but if it's you, let this loan go through, God. And we say stuff, and we've heard God's voice, and we've heard God say, go after that job. Everywhere your feet go is yours. And then we say, God, if it's you, let me get this job and not even have to submit an application. So I began to think about Peter just, just like me. Even though you've been given everything you need to be successful, we still have an if. You got the business plan. You got the money. You got the friends. You got the knowledge. You got everything, and you're sitting there with everything that God has called you to do, but because you've failed in your past, you won't even declare that God has called you to do that thing. <laughs> so sometimes what we do is we'll say, well, God, if, if it's you, God, if it's you, God, just let somebody call me tomorrow and say the word banana, 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 and then I'll do what it is you call me to do. And we get there because sometimes we've been so far down that we can no longer see. We can no longer see God, and we don't even expect that God can do it in our lives. Amen? 
Peter saw all the miracles. He walked with Jesus. He was in Jesus' circle. He, was, he supported Jesus. He was, he, was, he was even willing to fight for Jesus. He cut off the ear of the man that came to take Jesus on that night. But Peter still messed up. And guess what? You're going to mess up too. You're going to blow it. Pops, you, somebody in here, they're going to blow it. And you're going to know what to do, and you're going to blow it. But what do you do after you blow it? You're like, can you get there? Because I need to come on up. Because now I'm feeling down. But look at somebody and say, I'm down, but I'm not done. Come on, look at somebody and say, I'm down, but I'm not done. Ask yourself, where are you right now in the race? Where are you in relation to what God called you to do and be? Are you up? Are you moving? Are you walking? Are you scared? Ask yourself, where are you right now? And see, the thing is, some of us are struggling because what we've been called to do, it don't look like it's going to get done. Amen? And so we give Peter this hard time, but we begin to do the same thing. So let me get to it. Let me share with you a couple tips, a couple points on how, how to recover. Look at just your neighbor and say, it's time to recover. Matthew 26, 69, we won't read all through 74, so let's just drop down to 74. It says, then he began to call down curses. Peter had been, he said that he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word. For my first point on how to recover, look at somebody and say, remember the word. Come on, look at somebody else and say, remember the word. Come on, look at, look, look at the person behind you and say, and I need you to talk. Say, remember the word. When you are down, when you don't get it, when you don't see it, when it doesn't look like it's supposed to, you have got to begin to remember the word. Now, somebody might look at the scripture. See, we're getting caught up on what the word said to Peter, but I need you to fill in the blank on the word that God gave you. So right here it says, Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken before the rooster crows. You will disown me three times. But you got to remember what God said to you. You got to remember that you're the head and not the tail. You've got to remember that you're above and not beneath. And you can't let the fact that you just blew it and the fact that you're down keep you down. Look at somebody and say, remember the word. Sometimes when you get in that place and you, you feel down and out, you got to look at, you got to look and you got to say, what did Jesus say? And that's what Peter did. Now, the funny thing is sometimes we don't remember the word until we didn't already messed up. You remember as a kid when your mama would tell you don't do something? Soon as you did, and she would be like, well, don't go out there playing with them dogs because that dog might jump over that fence one day. And you'd be like, oh, mama, I got it, I got it. And you go out there and you're taking that little stick and you're walking along that fence. It's going, <laughs> y'all don't have fences like that no more. Y'all got the six-foot wooden shadow box fences in your, in your backyard like Patrick. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, y'all. Pat, Pat actually has a metal fence, but whatever. And then that dog jump over that gate. Or you get to the point where that gate ain't open, and now you got to take off running to get to your house, and you're like, oh, Jesus, I'm in the race. <laughs> because you had forgotten what your mom said. So what you got to do when you get down and you get out, <laughs> you got to begin to remember the word. Look at somebody and say, remember the word. Somebody just say, why you got to keep telling me to say stuff, Michaela? Because you got to remember the word. It's so easy to forget what God said to us, Jackie, when we get down. But what God, what did God call you to do? If you've been in Thrive Bible Study, one of the things we did about six months ago, we began to write down all of the things that we believe God said was for us. What is that thing that you wrote down that you know God said was going to come to pass in your life? And I know this is easier said than done, but when you get down, even when you blew it, you got to remember what God said about you. 
Even when my kids get bad grades, I tell them they're intelligent. I tell my kids that they're geniuses, even though they, even though they it might not look like it. Because you got to remember the word. Even when you lost your job, Pat, and I don't mean to give it. You told it already, so I can say it. Even when you lost your job and you was in the place that you didn't even know what was next for you, you had to begin to remember what God said was going to happen in your life. And sometimes we get so far down and we get so beat up that we can no longer remember what God said. And this is, what, this is what, what God said to Peter. He said, truly I tell you, Jesus, at this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But I need you to go back to the verse. I says, then Sean remembered the word. Fill in the blank. I don't know if you got a pen or paper, a notepad or something, but I want you to fill in the blank right now. I want you to write down what you have heard God say was going to come to pass in your life. Because when you get down, it has to say in the book of Psalm 26, 69 through 74, it's got to say, then Psalm remembered the word. Your business will be successful. It's got to say in the book of Tammy, 26, 69 through 74, then Tamara remembered the word that wherever I tread upon will be my land. Look at somebody and say, remember the word. Some of y'all ain't writing. I need you to go ahead and write it down. What did God say he was going to do? Because when you get to that place where it don't look good and you even blew up yourself, I need you to remember, remember the word. Second point. And, and, and while we're here, if you ain't got a word, let me give you some words to remember. If you got your Bible, turn to Philippians 4 and 19. Because if you don't have anything for yourself, and sometimes we haven't heard, I need you to remember these words. Philippians 4 and 19, if you got it, Aaron. It says, and my God will meet all your needs according to his riches and his glory in Christ Jesus. So if you don't have a word, this is a good one for you to remember. So when you get down, you go back to Philippians 4.19. And if you need another one, let me give you Jeremiah 29 and 11. And many of y'all already know this. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. These are words, if you can't remember what God said, these are words I need you to remember while you're on this race. The race ain't always easy, y'all. The race is the race. Is the race. Y'all know how y'all say this now. The young people, they say stuff like, the race is racing. Y'all, y'all put an I-N-G on the end of, you know, the race is racing. Or, but, but the race be racing. <laughs> Ministry be ministering sometimes when you come up in here, y'all. <laughs> you say whatever, you, the saints be sainting. But, y'all, the, the race ain't always easy. And it don't always look like. What God said. <laughs> but that's why God don't give you the middle. He says, I'm the Alpha and Omega. I'm the beginning and the end. You got to trust me in the, middle of the <laughs> in the middle of the beginning and the end. Amen. I'm starting to feel good, y'all. I'm feeling, I'm starting to feel, I'm starting to, you know, they would say, I'm starting to feel my help coming on. <laughs> because y'all, that race is tough. I'm, you know, you wait. Well, I ain't got to wait, then. Jay, I was just waiting for you to tell me, Jay. That's all, that's all I needed. Oh, that was good. I just, hey, I'm good. Hey, I just, I just needed somebody to tell me to take my jacket off. I'm good. Woo. Man, that thing right there. I feel, I, I feel, I feel. Woo. Y'all, y'all, I began. I'm, woo, I, feel, I feel. I mean, I felt the weight lifted off. <laughs> Let's throw that jacket away. That weight, that's the weight that so easily besets us. We need to get rid of that weight right there. <laughs> but, y'all, as we're on this race, here's the thing that I need us to get, and this is, 
The enemy is out here to destroy you, so he will throw in your face anything that he can do to cause you to hinder, to cause you to slow down. Y'all see I can point so much better and everything. I'm sorry, I'm back to my jacket. Michelle said, say one more word about it. Let me tell y'all what Michelle be. No, I ain't going to tell. I ain't gonna, but but y'all, seriously, the enemy will throw in your way anything he can to trip you up. And the thing that we don't talk about or the thing that I didn't learn about when I was younger when we talked about this Christian race is that, yo, sometimes you will stumble. Sometimes you will fall. What we did when I was younger, we talked about the people that stumbled and fell. When I was younger, we talked about people that messed up before they got married. What we did is we talked about you know, people that had issues in their marriage. And we talked about people that had, a ba- we like to say stuff like a baby out of wedlock is what we said when I was a kid. You know, we talked about people that stepped out. We talked about people that had a kid and didn't take care of them. And oftentimes we forgot to teach people how to run the race. You're going to fall in the race, y'all. You ever watch one of those triathlons or one of those where the people got to jump over the hurdle? and they jump over into the water, sometimes them people fall, and they got to figure out how to get back up. Look at your neighbor and say, it's time to get up. Ooh, y'all, I'm trying to tell you this race be racing. Point number two, Matthew 26. We're going to keep it right where we are. Matthew 26. We'll go right down to 75. It says, then Peter remembered the word. We already remembered the word. You fill in the blank. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. The, sec- the second point says, and he went outside and wept bitterly. For my second point, you've got to get away from the crowd. You've got to get away from the crowd. So the first thing you're doing, what's the first one? And then what's the next thing? Why do you got to get away from the crowd? You got to get away from the things that remind you of your mistake. You got to get away from the people that keep holding you down. <laughs> you ever been back to your hometown and the people in your hometown doing the same thing they were doing when you graduated high school 27 years? Sometimes you got to get away from that. <laughs> oh, you sometimes you got to remove yourself from the crowd so you can hear the voice of God. If you ever looked, if you ever been in a race, it's hard to run in a crowd. You end up stepping on other people's feet. You end up trying to breathe like they breathe. You end up trying to take the same strides that those people take. God called you to something different. So sometimes you got to get away from the crowd. (laughs) So Peter had to get away. Now, at this point, this is the third time that these people have reminded Peter that he blew it, right? He done already messed up twice, so now he's on his third time. Sometimes you got to get away from those people that keep holding you to what you did 25 years ago. And sometimes it's got to be your family. So sometimes while you're on this race, every once in a while you got to cut ties with the people that you grew up with, people that you love, because you got to get to the end of this race, and they ain't doing nothing but holding you back. Look at somebody say, I'm down, but I'm not out. (laughs) <laughs> and I know this is tough for some people, but you got to get away from the crowd. Sometimes you got to get away from your job. Sometimes that church you're sitting in ain't the place that you need to be either. Sometimes that group of friends that you hang out with after church ain't the, ain't the group of friends you need to hang, hang out with either because sometimes running in the crowd will keep you down. And sometimes the crowd will slow you down. Me and Lex go walking sometimes, y'all, and she be out there getting it. You know, and she running, bow, bow. I be running sometimes, too. But it just don't be as fast. In my mind, I be running fast, though. <laughs> so I be on the, I mean, I'm in the race. It's a long race, y'all. The, the race, it ain't short. The race is long. My race is different than Lex's race. And that's another point, y'all. While we right here, run your own race. Stop worrying about everybody else's race. You, you too busy looking at her race and this race, how fast she run. You run your own. Don't be worried about my race. I be running. All right. Let me, I try to get back to where I was at. But Lex be running, y'all. She be running. Bam, bam, bam. And sometimes she gets so far ahead of me, she circle back around. <laughs> and I'm still, I'm still getting it. She circle on me. 
And I'd be like, Lex, it's gone. And she said, no. See, if you got good people that's running with you, they'll still check on you. But they got to go run their own race. So sometimes Lex got to leave me so she can get what she needs to get. <laughs> you got to leave the crowd. Look at somebody and say, leave the crowd. Ooh, now that's a hard part. Y'all, it's hard. It's hard to cut that crowd loose. You've known them your whole life. You've been with them. They, these are my boys. When I was in the streets, this is who I ran with. Sometimes you got to cut that crowd loose because that crowd will continue to remind you of your mistakes. Woo. And then you got to be okay when you run in your race and somebody leave because everybody ain't for you no way. Somebody just waiting for you to fall. You know, I believe, you know, Sherry every now and then, she might stick her foot out when she be running by me because she want to. No, but there are people that are in your life that may be in your life right now. They don't want to see you finish this race. <laughs> Look at somebody say, I'm down, but I'm not done. Y'all, my wife will come back just to check you good because when I done ran, you know, the whole mile. Um, I'd be so tired. And she'd be like, Zay, you good after this mile you ran? And I'd be like, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> but it'd be distractions on the race. And when you're running with a crowd, it's distractions, y'all. You got to go get this race and this exercise and this workout. You got to go get it for yourself. Because I'm the kind, when I'm running, y'all, I can't talk. I am trying to live. I'm trying to live when I'm running. I'm breathing hard, and legs just, <laughs> clearly my race ain't her race, because she be, <laughs> you know. But, but y'all, sometimes you got to let that crowd go, too. Y you know what? Y'all go ahead on. I'm trying, I'm, I'm in recovery. I'm trying to get up. Sometimes you got to recover. All of these, y'all laughing, but all of these was points that I had. I scaled it down to three. But sometimes you got to recover from the race. I ain't joking. People that run races, they run a recovery run. I got all these notes, Aaron. I ain't even send them to you. But people do a recovery run to keep the oxygen in their muscles. Because if you, if you run a big race and then you don't run for a while, you get tight, you get locked up. They got to run some more just so they can continue their race. Look at somebody and say, I'm recovering. Hey. Every once in a while, you got to recover. And as Christians, we got to let people have the opportunity to recover. It ain't always in your time. It ain't the vision that you got for me. It's the vision that God has given me. Amen? I'm almost done, y'all. I promise. I'm almost done. Even Jesus had to get away. Matthew 26 and 36, it says, Then Jesus went with the disciples to a place called Gethsemane. I know some of y'all going to be like, you messed that up. I did. Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch for me. Sometimes, y'all, even Jesus had to leave the crowd. You got to get away. Last point, and we're getting out of here. We're going to stay in the same verse. It says, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside, and he wept bitterly. For my third point, I need you to look right at somebody and say, let it out. Come on, look at somebody and say, look right at them, look, say, let it out. Nah, you got to say it louder, let it out. Somebody right there needs to just holler, let it out. Sometimes we've been conditioned to keep everything in. <laughs> Peter had to remember the word. Peter had to leave the crowd. And then it said, Peter wept bitterly. When you mess up, it's all right. Let it out. Stop holding on to your mistakes. 
Stop holding on to your problem. Stop holding on feeling like you can't share and get rid of those things. The Bible said that I put those things behind me and I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling. You can't get to that prize if you're still holding on to what's behind you. There are benefits in crying, y'all. There are benefits in letting it out. Crying is a common human action, and it can be triggered by many different emotions. But crying also detoxifies the body. And there are different types, there are even different types of tears. But crying helps self, self soothe. It also dulls pain, it improves the mood, and it, it asks for support from your other bodily functions. In other words, it can help you recover. Look at somebody and say, let it out. <laughs> oh, the last one on crying, it helps you restore emotional balance. Some of us can't even run the race because we, 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 we won't let out what we've done. You got to let it out. Look at somebody say, let it go. Let it go. Isaiah 43 and 18. It says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. Y'all can call Hakeem because I'm about done in just a minute. And we about to rub. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing, look at somebody and say, a new thing. A new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. So in closing, let's go over them one more time. Look at somebody and say, I'm down, but I'm not out. Look at somebody and say, I'm recovering. Now let's go over those three points. What, what are the things that Peter had to do? After he blew it, he remembered the word. He had to get away from the crowd. And he had to let it out. Stand to your feet. Come on, somebody give God a praise. Come on, 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 give God a praise. <laughs> Woo. Y'all, there are some times that, that as Christians, as we talk about this race, as we talk about this journey, it ain't easy. And oftentimes we compare our journey to other people's journey. But people don't go through the same stuff. You ain't been through the same stuff I've been through. So your journey don't look like my journey. What I've dealt with in my past, you didn't have to deal with. You don't know what it was like growing up in the big city of Henderson, North Carolina. I don't know what it was like growing up in Philadelphia. Or I don't know what you had to deal with. So some of us sit and we look at Peter and we're like, how in the world? How could you deny Christ like that? But how many of us on a daily basis are denying what he called us to do? How many of us are denying that he said you will be victorious? But because you're dealing with issues, you can't see your triumph. So you begin to deny what he's called you to. So I'm not here to ask you to do anything crazy. But I'm here to ask you that if you know that you've been down and you're not in a place that you feel like God has called you to, and if our ministers could move, if you're not where you feel God has called you to for whatever reason, for whatever obstacle, I'm asking you right now to make a step towards this altar. Because today we're going to practice those three things. We're going to remember the word. We're going to leave the crowd and we're going to let it out. I don't